first of all, this war is mostly about us. Ukraine just happens to be the place that's being fought. Putin is obsessed with us. He wants victory. He wants to show, despite all of, all of our threats and all of our stuff, I can go in and wipe them out and put in my puppet and you can't do anything about it. That's, it's all aimed at us. I'm John Heilman, and this week on Hell and High Water, I talk with Julia Yaffe, a founding partner of and Washington correspondent for Puck News, and Michael McFall, former American ambassador to Russia, analyst for NBC News, contributing columnist to the Washington Post, and easily one of the foremost scholars studying Russia today. Julia, Michael, and I talk about Russia's invasion of Europe, the unexpectedly brave and so far uh, surprisingly successful resistance being put on by the people of Ukraine and the Ukrainian military. We talk about Vladimir Putin's motivations, the stakes for Joe Biden, and what to look for in the days and weeks to come when it comes to this massive crisis unfolding in the heart of Europe. We hope that you will enjoy it. Good morning, Ukrainians. Currently, there are a lot of games appearing on the Internet, like that I am asking our army to put down arms and evacuate. So I am here. We are not putting down arms. We will be defending our country because our weapon is truth. And our truth is that this is our land, our country, our children, and we will defend all of this. That is it. That is all I wanted to tell you. Glory to Ukraine. Glory to Ukraine. Mike McFall, I saw you, I think, on your Twitter yeah. feed. We're sitting here on Saturday. We're talking about Ukraine. We have Mike McFall, former U.S. ambassador to, uh, uh, to Russia. And, and uh, Julia Yaffe is going to join us shortly, but she'll join mid, mid-go because Mike McFall is a busy man. Um, it's day by day right now, right? And, and by the time this, this podcast comes out on Tuesday, God knows where we'll be. But, but, but I want to start with you because I know you're monitoring things very closely in ways that most of us can't even comprehend. I mean, seeing Zelensky on video, that video was, was, that was a, a audio, a, a Dover dub version of, of Zelensky early this morning, you know, doing a selfie video, basically saying, I'm still on the streets. Yeah. We're still resisting. I, I just, I think it's got t- t- probably 20 million views at this point on Twitter. And I can't, I have not felt a swell of admiration, awe, you know, at the heroism of this man uh, uh, in, the, in a long time from anybody on the world stage. Um, talk to me about what you've been feeling today, Mike. Well, John, I completely agree. Uh, Zelensky is one badass. Uh, he has stepped up. He is uh, the leader of the nation. Uh, I had the chance to host him out here at Stanford five or six months ago when he came to see President Biden. And, um, you know, I followed his career. I, I know him. I, I know his TV show, which, by the way, is really pop- used to be really popular in Russia. I found him to be very impressive. Uh, I have lots of Ukrainian friends, John. Uh, Ukraine is a democracy. It is a raw, rough and tumble, rock and roll democracy where they are divided. Um, And the American foreign policy elite that follows Ukraine, they also are very critical. And there's been lots of people over the years saying Zelensky didn't do this, he didn't do that. Uh, I've I've always been a big admirer of him. After he came out to Stanford, I felt the same way. I even wrote a couple of pieces about it. I think now the world knows what an incredibly brave, courageous leader that he has risen to be. Uh, and I have the, I felt exactly the same way that you just described your feelings. You know, the, that video, I woke up in the middle of the night and was cruising like I, I was, couldn't sleep. I woke up about three in the morning and I'm cruising Ukraine war Twitter. Uh, and I saw right at the moment when the AP dropped the story that had the reporting in it with uh, the U.S. basically telling Zelensky, we'll help you evacuate. You should leave the country. And Zelensky, the quote, which I think will be written in history books. Yes. You know, what, the, the quote, which was, I, I, I'm staying here, but quote, I need ammunition, not a ride. That is a that is a that's a scripted movie quote. That's something you yeah. see in a in a superhero film, not in a in real life. And. And, you know, we all have our flaws. I'm sure Zelensky has his flaws, too. And there's some plays in which, you know, as like all politicians, he, he didn't he said certain things he probably regrets and would go back and change. But he's under a lot of pressure. And right now, at the moment of maximum pressure, the guy seems to be performing, not just demonstrating individual heroism. And this goes to the larger question I want to ask you, because you were the first person of, of, of withstanding who started ringing the bell in the middle of last week when we were talking on TV. And you were like, Sanctions really matter, but what's going to matter more is, is the, the, the resistance on the part of the Ukrainian military and the Ukrainian people. That's going to matter most of all in terms of if there's any chance of beating back this invasion. And it feels to me like what Zelensky is, uh, that Zelensky understands that. And that yes. part of what he's doing is not just demonstrating heroism or machismo, but saying, we got to dig in here. All of us have to dig in. I'm staying because this is the only way through for us that's not going to end in disaster. That's exactly right. 
Uh, this is a fight for the, you know, for, it's a fight for his life. Let's be clear about that. Let's make it very crystal clear. It's a fight for freedom in his country. He understands that. And it's a fight, let's just be honest, that he's, they're fighting alone. The night that the campaign started, I was in touch with lots of Ukrainian friends, you know, politicians, elites, you know, the, we've had a big training program here at Stanford for a couple of decades, John. I think we've had about 300 Ukrainians through at an institute I run here. So we have a pretty big network of, of people. We have a lot of calls. And right as the bombing started, one of my close friends said, um, I won't name her, of course, but she said, I can't believe we have to fight this bastard alone. Right. And that's what they're doing. And I understand it. I want to be crystal clear. I support President Biden's decision. Uh, there is not a military option for the United States. But we got we to gotta come to grips with the fact that all of our unity that we keep yelling about and screaming about, isn't it great? We're all unified and we're all unified watching on the sidelines as this horrific, evil dictator tries to obliterate a free and democratic country. And so the only thing left right now is ammunition, just as Zelensky said, and more patriots and more stingers. Uh, why the hell we haven't sent more stingers? That, that, that needs to be a question for the future. But right now, it's all about the fight on the ground. And so anything we can do to support that, because we're not going to fight, we have to be all in. Their assault has not gone as well as planned. The question of what that means going forward is a large question. And the other thing that I saw, so that's a big story, the heroism of the Ukrainians, the, 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 you know, there's all the stories about the, the ghost fighters in the sky who are probably apocryphal, et cetera, et cetera. But there's the spirit of resistance there and, and the fact of resistance slowing Russia down. And at the same time, the trucks are rolling in with the thermobaric we weapons. And you know what that means. It means Aleppo. It means uh, Grozny. It means the worst thing that can happen in war, this short of nuclear weapons, People being burned from the inside out with, with, with bombs that suck the air out of the air and put fire and chemicals inside humans and buildings and leave nothing but dust in their wake. That, that could happen. By the time this podcast comes out, that could be happening in Kiev. So I guess I ask you what, whether, not to predict the future about whether you think that is where we're headed, but whether you think that all of this resistance is just making Putin crazier and that more and that that kind of barbarity and war criminal behavior is becoming more likely in some ways because of the fierce resistance and the heroism of the Ukrainian military and 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 the and citizens. Well, it's a great question. I, I don't have a great answer, uh, but I'd say a couple of things. Uh, first of all, I'm, I'm glad you pointed out the fact that uh, Mr. Putin has used these tactics before in Grozny, in Aleppo. He, he has slaughtered innocent civilians and he seems perfectly fine with it. Uh, so I won't be surprised if it happens here. It does seem like their strategy initially was some kind of shock and awe. They thought people were gonna run. They thought Zelensky was gonna go to Lviv for Poland, and then they would have a, a much easier time. That, now they're on to plan B, that didn't happen. Um, and over time, it's hard to imagine that eventually they won't be able to, to seize the major cities. They do have military, uh, you know, uh, asymmetries here, particularly in the air, particularly with rockets and planes. Mm -hmm. um, but that said, uh, I also am impressed with, uh, you know, the resistance so far. Um, you know, what I hear from Ukrainians reporting on it. And, you know, by the way, they have a free independent press in Ukraine, fantastic uh, set of journalists reporting on this war, uh, suggests that it is not going uh, the, the, as fast as they wanted. We're only in the early days, we should all remember, mm -hmm. right? Of course. Yep. Um, but, uh, and I fear those, I fear that. I want to I wanna be clear. I fear exactly what you just described. Uh, I watch Putin. You know, I've been watching Putin for a long time. I met him in 1991 the first time. I've written about him and I sat in the room with him, you know, when I worked five years in the Obama administration, whenever we had a meeting with him. Uh, so I, I, you know, this is a different man than 20 years ago. I think he's even a different man than just a couple years ago. The language that he uses is crude. He feels unhinged to me he's calling him fascists and uh drug users that by them you mean you could the ukrainians and, and zelensky they're nazis they're they're you know he's he's off the deep end yes he's trying to demonize them and it he with it's with you know it's with vigor right uh yeah. the language he's using is very crude russian language um so you know he's getting pissed off but what i don't understand if he would go to those horrific acts and, and i want to underscore I won't be surprised if he uses those kind of uh, tactics because he's used them before. 
Uh, he has no regard for civilian life. Uh, and he's convinced himself that these people are evil, right? Uh, you know, listening to his language. But then what? What happens the day after he puts some puppet in place? Medvedchuk or Yanukovych or something like that. Uh, there's no way that person can survive as a leader in Ukraine without the Russian military being there full stop for forever. Uh, by the way, I wouldn't I wouldn't want to take that job. Imagine, John, who, you know, talk about a death wish uh, to take that job. But what is his plan? Uh, the Ukrainian people are just not going to say, OK, that was too bad that we lost that war. And now let's listen to this guy. That's not going to happen. Uh, so it's and, and by the way, talking to Russian, you know, strategist types, because uh, I talked to all kinds of Russians, but the, the ones that are pretending to be neutral experts, I think it's kind of hard to be neutral and times like this, but they they can't they can't answer that question either. And neither can my friends in the in the Biden administration. That is the big mystery. Nobody understands what it what will be his plan if that moment comes. So I want to call we'll come back to Biden in a second. We're going to welcome Julia Yaffe here. So you came in a couple minutes later. We're so glad you're here. Thank you for being here, Julia. Um, you came in you the thing you got to miss or you're unfortunately not going to get to comment on now because I think Mike and I did a pretty good job uh, heaping praise on Zelensky and, and talking about his heroism. And we just talked about the extraordinary resistance that we're seeing uh, at this hour and on this day, on this Saturday, uh, the 26th of February, uh, on the part of Ukrainians. And I guess the question I want to open with you is picking up that thread is talk about what's going on in the streets of Russia, which is also kind of an incredible thing, you know, and, and not just in Russia, but in, in the Baltics and in uh, not just in one place in Russia, it's not dozens of cities where we're seeing uh, protests in the streets. I, just what do you make of that? And not just, you know, what it's what your first what your impressions are of it, the character of it, the intensity and so on. But what you think the implications of that might be going forward when it comes to Putin's calculus? I think the protests in Russia are both notable and not notable, um, or significant, but not not significant. It's significant because it's happening after a year of just Putin kind of carpet bombing the opposition. So many people have been driven out of the country or put in jail for ridiculous made up things, um, like posting music videos on their social media, like, um, just being related to somebody who's in the opposition. Oh, for example, a 16-year-old uh, boy was a couple of weeks ago given three years in a penal colony because he blew up something labeled the FSB headquarters on Minecraft. 16-year-old yeah. child, I mean, um, yeah. for Minecraft. For and so that's the context in which these protests are happening. This is no longer 2012, it's not 2014, and it's not even 2021. Um, the price of protesting and opposing Putin has gotten much, much higher. It's become much, much more dangerous. And so the fact that anybody came out at all, the fact that people are posting no to war all over their social media is significant. Uh, and you're already seeing a crackdown. So 900 people were arrested in Moscow alone that first night when people came out in spontaneous protest. But also an 18 year old woman was arrested in Moscow for hanging a bed sheet from her balcony that said no to war. Um, at the same time, you know, I've spent a lot of time watching Russian TV last night. I was watching it and the picture people are getting who watch TV are is very different. It is a totally different universe. Um, the off offensive is going really well. It is about denazification, whatever that, you know, that means. Uh, it is about liberating people from uh, Ukrainian war crimes. There are zero casualties, apparently, which we now know is not true. Russia has lost at least 3,000 to 3,500 soldiers in the first three days alone. And um, <clears throat> everything's going great. Oh, and... Uh, Russian soldiers, according to Russian state TV, are being greeted as liberators. Mm -hmm. uh, and though people are, there are fewer people watching Russian state TV than there were a decade ago, you know, this still the older, kind of more rural population is watching this. And that, if you're watching that, that's the image you see. Um, I think Americans like to put a lot of hope in Russian protests, and every time 
Russians come out into the streets, I get asked, you know, are they going to topple Putin? And I don't think they are because Putin still has a monopoly on force and a monopoly on violence in Russia. And in the last 10 years since those big pro-democracy pro protests we saw right before his third, uh, his um, returning to office for a third presidential term, he has created ever more security organizations and has invested more and more heavily in cracking down on dissent and investing in, you know, uh, security infrastructure to keep him in place. I think the real danger to Putin comes, as always, from the elites. The last two revolutions Russia has had, they, it was because of a crisis in the elites and a splintering of the elites. And uh, as I wrote on Twitter yesterday, I think the only way out of this is going to look like something out of clue, like Sergei Narushkin, the head of uh, foreign intelligence, you know, in the yeah. conservatory with a candlestick. It's, yes. I don't think it's going to be street protests that uh, get Russia out of this and get Putin out of Russia. Michael McFall, before I ask you about, before we, I, I turn this, the question of sanctions in a second. No, I want to talk about this. I was literally about okay. to say, I was, like just, I, was about, I was about to say, before <laughs> I turn to the question of sanctions, which, which Julia talked about the swift sanctions, and, and there's obviously other debates going on. Why would you want to talk about that? But before I get to that, I want to give you a chance to answer, to, to reply to that, whether you think that, that, she, that Julia has it right. Uh, or whether you're more optimistic about the possibility of a popular protest. Mike is always more optimistic than I am. Well, well, that's okay. That's okay. I'll give him a chance. He obviously is like that. You, he's, he's rising like a, like a fish out of water going well, for but, a big but, hunk of bait. Well, just let me say a couple things. And I, I, yes, uh, some people, you know, social scientists try to figure out causation. Uh, Julie's right. I am optimistic. And the causal uh, mechanism there is I was born in Montana. Uh, I, I, didn't, I, haven't and I was born in Soviet Moscow. Exactly. And that says a lot about, mm -hmm. but, but, but I want, I want to put on my professor hat if I can, John, just for a minute. And I'm happy to then put on my sanctions foreign policy hat in a, in a second. Just, just a couple of things. I'm actually right now, as we speak, I just taught on Friday, I'm teaching a course on social mobilization and democratic breakthrough or not. Uh, right. So both. Uh, and by the way, I'm teaching it with a, a professor who was one of the activists in the Egyptian revolution, Tahrir Square in 2011. So, um, and every week uh, we have a, uh, an activist from the various cases, right? And I hate to use the word case to talk about people's lives and histories, but we have somebody. We had somebody from South Africa. We had somebody from Serbia, 2000. We just did the Soviet Union. Uh, and then we did, uh, you know, we did uh, Egypt uh, yesterday. And what I would say is Julia is, is, is right and wrong. It's a combination of these things. It's a, we do not have one uni, unified theory of democratic breakthrough. There are multiple pathways. Uh, usually, including all the cases I just mentioned, it is a combination of splits between the elites and popular mobilization. That's what happened in South Africa. That's what happened in the Soviet Union. That's what happened in Serbia in 2000. That's what's happened in the Orange Revolution in 2004. Um, and and so, so A, that's that first, let's understand that. B, I think it's really important, the other point that Julia said about the nature of this regime. Um, uh, Julia, I was just on Echo Moscow like four or five days ago, a, a radio station you know well, and um, uh, you know, we were talking about these very things. Uh, this was before the war started. And and I was saying, why aren't there more protesters? That day there were six, John, and they got arrested. Uh, and they said, Michael, you've been gone for eight years, man. Uh, this is a different Russia than when you were ambassador. And I think that's a really important thing. I don't think it's a coincidence that all that cracking down on the opposition took place before he invaded. Uh, but third, third, autocrats make mistakes. They make mistakes all the time. Uh, we treat them like they're 10 feet tall, and then we wake up the next day, and they're not 10 feet tall. I once wrote, uh, you know, I write about revolutions, and I said, before revolutions, they seem impossible. After revolutions, they seem inevitable. They seem inevitable. And I just want to, I just think we need to understand, we're not good at the social scientists as predicting these things. Believe me, I worked five years in the Obama administration. The CIA is horrible at predicting these things. They didn't predict the Green Revolution in Iran. They didn't predict the uh, the Arab Spring 2011. They didn't predict the protest in Russia. I, I believe they I believe I believe they missed the downfall and, of the Soviet Union. As a rather 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 so famous. Just remember, um, like maybe the world. We need to be humble about what we know about the future. Yeah. 
Uh, but but here's the mistake I, I actually now. But if I'm pressed, here's the mistake that I think Putin's made. So he, he's been on a run. You know, he's been you know, he's four for four in the last uh, wars he's fought. Uh, he is in complete control. He has a incredibly sophisticated autocratic regime in place. Uh, and I think he overreached. I really think this is the beginning of the end of Putin and Putinism. I don't know if we're going to measure that in years or even decades, but I think he overreached. Uh, you know, I, you'd be surprised of the kind of Russians I interact with. They're not just the opposition leaders, you know, the, the, the cartoonization that Putin wants you to believe. I just was talking to an interlocutor of one of the biggest billionaires oligarchs in Russia uh, today, just literally 48 hours ago. And, and, you know, without naming names, nobody supports this stupid war. They, nobody supports yeah. this. Uh, and, and that doesn't mean they're going to protest, but it does mean that over time, you know, there's this great piece by a guy named Timur Koran. It's called, it's about preference falsification. I'm sorry for sounding like an academic, but I'm going to post it and make sure you, people you read said it. You, were gonna, you said you were going to put, you said you were going to put have my professor's, professor's head on. on. I, didn't, I didn't say you get to get, you can use your professional okay, right. I, never, didn't get, I did not get permission. Right. It's that. a great piece about 1989 and, and where right before everybody said these regimes are they're strong blah 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 and then overnight we saw what happened and he writes about what preference falsification you have no incentive whatsoever living in putin's russia today to tell people honestly what you think you're a fool if you do that but we not we have to be careful that we don't misinterpret that as being support for what he's doing today can i just sorry can i so just chime in here um, yeah. I, yeah, yeah, you can, I, of course. I, <laughs> I tease Mike for being optimistic, but as usual, I agree with him on all three points. And hmm. people often throw around Putin's impressive uh, popularity ratings or approval ratings, which have, by the way, fallen by something like 20 points. And they're still super high, but uh, it doesn't really tell you all that much. You know, if you're an older person with a landline and somebody from an official, you know, and you're an older person who remembers the Soviet Union uh, and somebody from an official sounding organization calls you and asks you, do you like Putin? What are you going to say? Yeah. And, yeah. I, I and mean, I, you know, and uh, I mean, we have problems with public opinion polling. With accurate <laughs> exactly. Polling in America, <laughs> just imagine just imagine what it is if like you answer wrong and your fear is that you're going to be. And I remember like, you know, I so remember, like, you know, a decade ago when it was a much more permissive political climate, I remember a pollster at the very respected independent Levada Center saying, you know, we don't really measure public opinion, we measure how well propaganda works. But something that yes, right. Mike said about revolutions seeming impossible before they happen and seeming inevitable after the fact is something Mike has been saying for a while and it has really burrowed into my brain and I think about it all the time and I quote Mike to people on this all the time because I do agree with it having, you know, obsessively studied the revolution of 1917 and of 1991, if you can call it a revolution. In 1991, when the elites carved up the Soviet Union and undid the whole thing, when it fell, I think this is where the lack of support, even if it's passive, matters a lot. When it fell, nobody gave a shit and nobody tried to undo it and nobody, um, nobody was sad to see it go, right? Uh, it fell on if you know it fell on very kind of um, fertile soil and in 1917 and this is one I've been thinking about a lot the revolution came after Tsar Nicholas II who was very informationally isolated and talking to his wife and Rasputin got into World War One a stupid war that Russian soldiers didn't know they were fighting and three years later he was out and another year after that he was shot in a basement and it's something, and it was because, like, again, uh, he abdicated the throne, right? It was a change from the top, but there was so much unrest in the country because of the poverty and the um, stress that the population was feeling after three years of war. And you had so soldiers deserting to go home and help their families with the harvest because they were starving. Um, and it's something I've been thinking about a lot in the run-up to this war that, you know, is this going to be... Putin's 1914. I have. I also think this is the beginning of the end for Putin. If it takes a few months or a few years, I think this is his. This is his like tragic mistake, um, where he overreaches, believes the information he, the very bad information he's getting inside his bubble, 
uh, if you look at the Security Council meeting, yeah. that was very indicative. And um, yeah, I, you know, I, I see today, for example, there was a video that went around of a young man, a Russian soldier captured by Ukrainians, Ukrainians filmed him, filmed him and they asked where he was from and his birth uh, date of birth, you know, who his parents were. And it turns out he was from a little village in um, the Smolensk area, which was which had become famous for adopting a lot of orphans in the late 90s, early 2000s. And he said, I'm adopted. And he was born in March 2000. So he was born the month and the year that Vladimir Putin was first elected to office, to, pres uh, to the presidency. And it struck me for two reasons, like you have the people who are already the most socially vulnerable, they have these, con they first sent in a wave of conscripts, right, as cannon fodder almost, the casualties are much higher than they expected. And um, again, the most socially vulnerable, but also like people who literally were born with Putin's presidency. I don't think that's a coincidence. And I don't think that's going to, I think that's going to have major consequences for Putin. It'd be like the part of the not a great generation to be part of the Putin generation. Um, I want to I want to I want to play a piece of sound now that relates to to, to the U.S. response. But then I, I really I want to come back to, to I'm going to use it to, to come back to something that that uh, Mike McFall said a little earlier. So let's let's play right now. This is uh, the, the most you know, Joe Biden's been on TV. He's been in front of the camera a decent amount, uh, not every day, but a lot over the first week of this crisis. Um, he did an interview last Friday with Brian Tyler Cohen. You have two options. Start a third world war, go to war with Russia physically, or two, um, make sure that uh, a country that acts so contrary to international law ends up paying a price for having done it. I think these sanctions, I know, I know these sanctions are the broadest sanctions in history and economic sanctions and political sanctions. And my goal from the very beginning uh, was to make sure that I kept all of NATO and the European on the same page. Because the one thing I think that Putin thought he could do was split NATO, creating a great aperture for him to be able to walk through. Right. And uh, that hasn't happened, if you notice. It's been complete unanimity. So, Michael McFaul, I want to go back to the thing you said earlier, um, which is, you know, you're you're with the Biden administration. You agree with the policy, which is sanctions and 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 no U.S. troops on the ground. And that's been they've been very clear about that. But you also made the point that I swear, man, I hear from more people, normal people, not people like us, not people who are in this in this racket of ours in any way who just man, someone texted me after I was talking about the incredible heroism of the Ukrainians and then the the prospect of of of. Of, of thermobaric weapons being inflicted on Kiev. Someone just wrote to me, in, in, a, a very smart person who's not connected to this world, who just, who just wrote the following sentence to me in a state of total despair, which was, there is no one to help them, exclamation point. And I thought, when you said basically those same words earlier, it raises this question, right? You know, the Germans are now sending, are saying they're gonna send arms. There's discussions in, in the European Union. There's obviously all the NATO action. Beyond like sanctions, I think at the beginning of last week, you said, you know, if things get really bad, sanctions are going to seem pretty thin. And even hearing Biden on, the, you hear him defend what we're doing and you're saying as a matter of logic, it all makes sense. But in, as we see all these things, how long the sanctions are going to take to bite and all of this, there is this moment of like, these are, these people are defenseless and no one is going to help them. And they, they quite, it may very well be on the way to slaughter. So what should we be doing? Like what, what should the world, I, this is the most basic question I can ask. We could parse it 25 different ways, but what should the world be doing right now to help Ukraine and today, to right? Putin? Not what we should have done. Today. No, today for the next week going forward. Right. I know we could debate the past all, you know, for months and we will probably, but I'm just talking about right now going forward. More we'll javelins, more, more stingers. It's just as simple as that. And I mean, I mean, I can go on. I'm using those as metaphors, that, but that's what they need. I mean, literally yes. yesterday through an interlocutor, I heard from a, a leader in Kharkiv saying, we are running out of javelins. Help, help, help us get javelins. That city is under attack. By the time this podcast goes live, it may be uh, taken. Uh, now, you know, it begs the question, why didn't they have more javelins before, by the way? Uh, why didn't they have more stingers before? Right. To the best of my knowledge, the United States has not 
us. We haven't provided any singers yet. We're asking other allies to do that. But right now, more singers, more javelins. And then second, I was on this Zoom call with all of our colleagues in, you know, the 70 or 80 uh, Ukrainians who have been in various programs at Stanford yesterday. And he said to your, you know, we were asking your question too, John. He said, knee pads. And that was, that was very jarring to us. And I said, well, what do you mean knee pads? He said, we can't, we're, we're running out of knee pads here. And I said, well, what do you need knee pads for? And he says, you, you need that kind of very basic stuff. And by the way, he said for his gear, it, it was $2,000. Uh, he, he bought $2,000 worth of, of equipment. You know, he's a businessman. Uh, most Ukrainians can't afford that. So anything that can help fight the war, that is the most important thing. Sanction, I'm glad they're doing sanctions, but sanctions takes years to have any impact. It's all about making this as costly as possible for Putin to fight this war. Right. So that's so that's in the sh in the short term. It's basically and by short term, I don't mean just today, but I mean over the uh, while this war is hot and while there's still stuff to fight for and 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 and, and Ukraine is not yet a wholly owned subsidiary of, of Russia. That's it's arm the Ukraine. It's basically like do everything we can militarily to, to put guns in their hands to help them def to defend themselves and fight this off. That's number one. Julia, to your point about what can we help do to bring Putin down? You're basically you were your argument before was part of like the way you guys were discussing the interplay between, you know, how protest in the street versus other kinds of pain that can be brought. It does go back to kind of speaking about sanctions, because in the medium to longer term, and this is what I think Joe Biden, you know, when he says, look, he acknowledges sanctions are a long term thing. And just like <clears throat> McFaul just said, like what when you think about the oligarchs, when you think about the class the, the elite class that, that has either tolerated or supported Putin because it's been there in their economic interest to do so. What, what, is the glo what's a, what does it feel like a global strategy would look like to inflict enough pain on them where the thing that McFall said earlier, which is they're not for this war, but they're just not gonna be against it. How do you, what's the thing that, that, that turns that tide as a matter of practical policy or as a matter of like economic of, of international opprobrium how do we do that how do we get the, the oligarchs to say we've had a fuck enough with this guy we gotta we gotta we gotta withdraw and let the guy do the clue candlestick in the back room thing and we'll I'll be fine with that i think a lot of what we're doing um you know first the uk and then much of pretty much all of europe has closed their airspace to russian planes a lot of these oligarchs have family and property in London, Paris, Spain, Italy, etc. Uh, for example, this what I keep seeing in Russian media is um, freaking out over the the EU ban on Airbus and any any technology exports to Russia related to aviation and space, which covers Airbus exports and Airbus um, spare parts and something like 40%, I saw 41% of the Russian domestic uh, fleet is Airbus. So that means they won't be able to service 40% of their domestic airlines. The ruble has tanked. It has reached an all-time low. Let me just check what it is right now. Uh, it is almost 90 to the dollar. A decade ago it was 30. So that means it's a further chipping away of Russian uh, spending power. Uh, Prices have been going up steadily since 2014. They're going to spike now, even as they can buy, the ruble can buy less and less of it. That means less food. Um, you already see Russian stores reacting with uh, hiking their prices on, te on tech products and even domestic appliances. I think this um, tech import uh, export ban is going to really, really hurt Russians. Uh, I think, you know, the thing that has in the first, I would say the first 15 years of Putin's power, the thing that was really the most effective were pro, um, pocketbook issues. And people would, you would get much bigger protests when things like, for example, all of the Russian Far East was up in arms and like thousands and thousands of people came out into the street, much more than had ever come out in Moscow or St. Petersburg, for example, because the Kremlin declared they could no longer import uh, right side cars with right side steering wheels from Japan, which is like what the entire Far East drives. It's these things that you can't necessarily expect. Um, but I think that's also that's going to hurt people, just regular Russians. I'm already seeing Russian friends 
uh, saying, you know, people are canceling contracts, payments are getting canceled, dollar transactions are basically impossible. I mean, the biggest retail bank has been sanctioned. That's like sanctioning Bank of America. Um, and that's going, I think that's going to hurt the elite too. Um, the only issue is, I think it's, how many people can you peel off? Because I think a lot of them, like Putin's childhood friends, they will probably go down with the ship. You know, we tried, the U.S. tried to peel them off in 2014, but, you know, they moved some, some assets around. They registered them to their kids or their, or their wives. But now we're sanctioning kids as well and family members, which we weren't willing to do before. And I think that's really good. But again, I think that's going to take, to Mike's, I agree with Mike's point, it's going to take a while. The, the thing that, st that struck me, though, I'll say this, you know, uh, it, it, toward the end of last week, there was there was there was there, the fact was reported that in the midst of all of this and, you know, the Europeans are all sticking together and we're going to do swift and we're going to hit all the, we're going to do all these economic sanctions, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And then I read about how uh, Europe is the European utilities are buying more Russian natural gas through Gazprom uh, in the days ahead than they were in the days prior. Like the one place that could really cripple the Russian economy, Ambassador McFall, I believe you'll agree with me, is on energy. And it's the one place where the West is like, ah, we want to be as tough as we could possibly be with Vladimir Putin, ah, but we really need that energy. And so we're not going to do a fucking thing about that. And I, I guess I ask you whether that is another one of the unfortunate economic realities that that is just we have to live with because it's like a law of physics. Or is that also in some way an indication of a lack of genuine political will about doing what it would really take to not end this war because that again is a long-term solution not a short-term solution but to really show vladimir putin the door well i'd say a couple of things i mean first the the more strategic thing uh john you'll remember i worked in the obama administration so i was part of the transition team i wrote the main memo for our transition and we had five major strategic objectives we wanted to get done uh and number four was end european energy dependence on Russia. That was that was the winter of 2008. Yeah. Uh, and I just I, I underscore that because there is ways to do it. It is not impossible. There just has not been the political will to tackle it. It's a, it's better than it was in 2008. But we use you know, you can just look up the numbers and, and you can see the dependencies. By the way, I'll bet you a lot of your listeners will be uh, shocked to know that we import more oil from Russia than we do from Saudi Arabia. Uh, so the political will is not here. Not what, that market has been disrupted in the last couple of days, but, but right. that, that was going on through this entire time. Um, second, uh, so yes, we could. And, and by the way, some, there are some creative ideas out there. Uh, one of them is, a, is an import tax on Russian energy. So we're not cutting it off. We're just going to make it more expensive than other markets. And that would have a major disruptive impact on their ability to, to earn money from those from what they export. But I don't see the political will for that yet. I, I, I hope that that debate changes, right? You already see it like t three days ago, Swift, I was told by some administration official, we can't do it, we can't do it. And now we did it, right? right. So maybe that'll come. Um, central bank sanctions, uh, you know, the former finance minister of Ukraine, uh, incredibly savvy person, uh, 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 who knows these markets well, Natalie Yuresko is her name. That's what she's calling for. That would be, you want to talk about disruption, that would be disruptive. So there is more we can do on that front. Uh, uh, if we want to, we, we just do not have the political will yet. I want to play another quick clip here. Um, the This this struck me uh, because it starts to ask the questions. Obviously, we have there, there's a lot, as you said before, Mike, it's early days. Um, but people are already starting to talk about what comes next here, if it's right that eventually, uh, that eventually, despite the difficulties they're having, despite the difficulties the Russian military is having, the slower going than expected, despite the fierce and heroic resistance of the Ukrainian resistance and, and military that eventually uh, keeps going to fall and, and Russia is going to uh, own, own Ukraine. Um, on British television, uh, the Latvian deputy prime minister and defense minister, Artis Pabriks, uh, was on TV saying something that struck me about about the stakes here, not in the long term, but in the short term. If Europe will just watch like we are doing now, if we will not engage fully in supporting Ukrainians, if Ukraine fall, 
believe me, the strategic situation of Europe and transatlantic alliance will be totally different. And I can use all my authority and experience to tell this to you, because when we in the Baltics and in Poland, we were warning the Western leaders about what will happen with Georgia in 2008, we were right. In 2014, we warned about Ukraine and Crimea. We were right. Yeah. When we were warning that Belarus will be invaded and swallowed by Russia three years ago, we were right. Please believe us today and act now. So, Julie, Julie that goes to both a, a backward-looking question and a forward-looking question. You know, all of the, these Baltic republics and, and, and all of these bordering, these, these other uh, Central and Eastern European countries, that, that's a very common refrain, which is, uh, First of all, we'd like an apology from all of you people who doubted us about what Vladimir Putin would do. And second of all, if, if you once we get the apology, please understand the implications, which is he's not going to stop at Ukraine. He's we're all going to be under threat and we need to do much more than we're doing right now. Um, just talk to me. Talk to me about that and about the way in which the region that you're very familiar with, the former Soviet Union, is looking at these moves and, and their their degree of concern and 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 what might uh, arise in the coming days and weeks because of that concern? Well, I think if we're going to look backward, we should start with, you know, a lot of people are criticizing the West for expanding NATO too far. I would criticize the West and specifically the George W. Bush administration for doing it sloppily. So in 2008 at Bucharest, uh, George W. Bush and Condoleezza Rice pushed for over French and German objections, pushed to uh, pushed for this open door policy for Georgia and Ukraine to basically uh, invite them in. And there were people, you know, the French and the Germans and also people inside the U.S. government who said this is a terrible idea because you're just going to infuriate Putin. These two former Soviet republics are so core to Russia's sense of self as an empire. So the U.S. did it anyway but then didn't let them in. So what ended up happening is we got the worst of both worlds. We infuriated and taunted Russia, right? It's like bringing out the red cape and moving it around in front of the bull. But then we left them twisting in the wind. We didn't give them the protections that infuriating Putin uh, you know, would protect them against. Um, and I think there's a lot of, you saw that frustration with Zelensky's statements in the lead up to the war where he was, throwing shade at Biden and people in the in uh, other countries in NATO, he said, you know, you keep talking about how no, we will never officially close the door to Ukraine, we can never do such a thing. But then at the same time, you're not letting us in. And I think that one of the ways actually to have avoided this war would have been to let and to avoid the war in Georgia would have been to just let them in. I really don't I think that even back then, uh, and even now, I think the um, I think that's an extra step, even for the clearly even more deranged Putin. I think it would have offered some protection, and I don't know that he would have dared to invade a Ukraine that was in NATO. I I, I was looking for the earliest Mike McFall on on video, and and I found a thing. The earliest thing we could find was from 1999. You were at a, at a conference. Um, uh, and at a U.S. Institute of Peace panel. And, at the, and what you said at the end, you said... U.S., Russia, and U.S.-Soviet relations have gone from being the core uh, foreign policy concern for both countries to being Russia now on the periphery of our concerns and really on the periphery of the international system in general. They're dependent on us, and that's why they resent us, and that's why they want to poke us in the eye anytime they can. Now, for, to me, if you accept this core periphery uh, model, Russia has two choices. One is to continue to try to do things to be reintegrated into the core. And I believe it's still possible. I'm an optimist on that front. But the other option, of course, is the option that Peter hinted at, which is to be a rogue state. How do you get the attention of the core when you're down and out? Well, if you got 10,000 nuclear weapons, you, you be a pain in the ass, frankly. I think pain in the ass is one way to describe what's going on right now in a very kind of cheeky, uh, understated way. But the nuclear thing is really on the table, and it freaked me out this week. I will say to hear Vladimir Putin talking about nuclear weapons, use, threatening to use them, and then the French foreign minister saying, you know, yes, I take that as a threat. He should remember that NATO is a nuclear armed alliance also. Again, it's obviously correct. That's true. And yet nuclear saber rattling right now has my teeth on edge. 
Is that have your teeth on edge? Or do you think that this is all sort of play acting and we don't really have anything to worry about here? I, I don't want to end with you in a too apocalyptic place, but how much does this feel potentially not like a new Cold War, but a new hot war that could really escalate and get out of control? I'm worried. Of course I'm worried. Uh, and I want to say two things about it. Uh, first of all, this war is mostly about us. Ukraine just happens to be the place that's being fought. Putin is obsessed with us. He wants victory. He wants to show, despite all of all of our threats and all of our stuff, I can go in and wipe them out and put in my puppet and you can't do anything about it. That's It's all aimed at us. And by the way, I'm afraid of that because if he wins, that people all over the globe are going to be looking at us. I, I'm, I'm in touch with people in Asia and the Middle East, and they're going to be wondering, who do I line up with? Uh, you know, if we are back in the, the jungle uh, where there's no multilateral institutions, there's no liberal international order, it's just the jungle, then you got to make a decision. Where, uh, are you lining up with him or are you lining up with us? So the, the stakes are very high. And when he throws on top of that nuclear weapons, we should be serious about it. I can't tell you how many conversations I've had over the last several weeks with, you know, armchair geostrategists. I hate to be flippant, but, uh, you know, everybody's an expert on Putin these days. Um, by the way, I wrote, I wrote my first anti-Putin piece just because we're going back in history in March 2000, uh, saying we need to be worried about this guy as an autocrat because autocrats screw up the world. Um, uh, but I can't tell you how many times I heard, oh, he's not serious. Oh, he would never do that. Oh, this is just about NATO expansion. If we could just sit down and give him that. Listen to the guy. He is serious. Listen to his words. When he says denazification, he means he is going to kill Mr. Zelensky. Uh, listen to him. And when he threatens, that is a threat that we have to take seriously. Now, we don't want to overreact. And he would be a, it, he, right. you know, it would be a nuclear holocaust where he would die too. But I think we've got to, we've just so underestimated this guy for so many years of his intentions. By the way, I think we've underestimated their capabilities too. That's for another day. But on the intention piece, we keep thinking, oh, we're going to pivot to China and we got to focus on that. This is just a distraction. People really, literally wrote that. 10 days ago. This is just a distraction to the real fight, which is about, you know, Asia. No, right now, uh, and I'll, I'll leave with this thing from uh, one of my friends who sometimes we've had some radical disagreements over the three decades. Uh, his name's Gary Kasparov. Uh, but, but Gary and I, you know, we agree on most things. And during the transition, John, he said this to me, and I was you know, working with my friends in the Biden administration, where it's all about the Asia pivot and we just want a stable and predictable relationship with Putin. Uh, but he said something profound and I think he's, you know, he's been right. He said, yeah, for the long fight, yes, dealing with the, the threat of China in the 21st century is, is right, but we got to get to that long fight because the immediate fight is going to happen in Europe and it's with this guy, Vladimir Putin. And I think he was dead right about that and i hope we're up to the challenge you you and i and 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 mike mcfall and others you know have spent one one subdivision of our discussions around all of this um over the last week inevitably has been the kind of u.s domestic front and and the, you know what 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 putin has done to the republican party or what he helped accelerate the republican party and the trump thing that's a whole other podcast like we could spend a lot mm -hmm. of time on it but i but i do kind of want to ask you in the context of the, the last, this will be because this is kind of the last question of what Michael McFall was just saying. The, it, it feeds into one question that that we can focus on, which is what which is what's in Putin's head. And we often, you know, seeing Donald Trump and Mike Pompeo and Tucker Carlson and Laura Ingram and JD Vance and 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 the uh, the the Josh Hawley with his little tiny bird hands out in Missouri, the, shakes his fist for the insurrection. Seeing all those people providing him with. With, with words of either praise, warm praise, or non-condemnation, people say, well, well, that's a propaganda victory for Putin. I'm sure you agree with that. But what is it, as Putin filters information, how does that, that victory that he's clearly won in the United States, how does that feed back into, do you think, on the basis of your, you know, your, all of the psychoanalyzing you've done of him, how does it feed back into the way he thinks about things like, uh, about, further territorial aggression 
in Eastern Europe about and Central Europe about the possibility of, of, of actually using nuclear weapons. Mike McFaul just said, we have to take it seriously, so let's take it seriously. How much does he look at that and say, when he sees the former president of the United States talking the way he does, say, hey, you know what? You know, I'm getting criticized in large parts of the world, but I got a lot of backers out there too, and some pretty powerful ones in the United States. How, you know, that Republican Party's not against me. Does that play a role? And does that make you even more concerned about how potentially bad this all could go under some non-implausible scenarios that we could both sketch out? Yeah, I think, uh, I think you're exactly right. And what I want to point out is that, well, first of all, I want to say Mike is totally right, that nothing annoys me more than uh, American editors and TV anchors who are like, okay, but what does Putin really want? I'm like, he, he says it straight out. He wants a fight with the U.S. He in declaring war on Ukraine, he talked about the U.S. the whole time, not even NATO. NATO, he was like, oh, they're just, you know, America's bitches. Um, my fight is with the U.S., and if you try to meddle, I will use nuclear weapons. Like, he said it. It's not about Ukraine, and there's no reason he will stop there. He just threatened Finland, for fuck's sake, you know? Um, but then getting back to your point, I don't think that, I think it makes it easier for him. For example, you know, what what happens when there's a Republican House and Senate after, so in January, right, after the November elections? What happens if there's a Republican president in 2024 or after the elections of 2024? It gets sworn in a few months later. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> you know, and, and what I want to point out to people like people, you know, the horseshoe has become such a, you know, not just a circle, but a snake eating its own tail. You see people on the hard left and the hard right, you know, uh, cheering for Putin. And Putin doesn't respect you. <laughs> like, he doesn't respect Trump. He doesn't respect Tucker Carlson. He doesn't respect Glenn Greenwald or Julian Assange. Either he sees you as they're all they're, they're all his they're all his bitches basically. They're his. I was you took the words. <laughs> no, I get away with that a second time. Yeah, yeah. no, they're I'll do it for you. It. That's all right. No, I saw. I saw. Where we're going. Like he doesn't want to be friends with America. He they, like this whole um, you know Trump talking about how we have to be friends with Russia and respect Russia and respect its secure you know as you're hearing from the left none of this would have happened if we had taken russia's security concerns seriously that's not what he wants like he wants to own you and you're just owning yourself for him and i'm not saying this you know conflict for conflict's sake that we should automatically just be against russia because they're against us or just i don't even think it's russia be, uh, be against putin and the people around him just because they're against us but you know at this point it's not just some guy I remember when I moved back from Russia um, a decade ago and meeting some of John McCain's staffers who were like, oh, Russia's just, you know, a nuclear armed gas station or like China's gas station. I don't think that's true anymore. And, you know, and, and Obama said that Russia's just a regional power. I don't think that's true anymore. I think it's kind of, you know, superpower is as superpower does. And Putin is not afraid to flex those muscles. And the more we, you're throwing, you know, it's, it's like, it's not going to be better for you if Russia wins. Right. Um, it's you hear these arguments on the left as well. I feel like the right is getting a lot of heat for their criticism of Biden. But I think the left has been fucking awful on this. Like, this is not our fight. Blah, blah, blah. Like, this is it's so classically American. We want all the benefits and none of the costs. We want to not touch social security and we want, you know, and we want our Medicare, but we don't want, but we want lower taxes and somehow that's supposed to work. And we want low price shit made in China, like cheap shit made in China, but we, but we still want everybody to, you know, it all to be manufactured here and people to be paid $50 an hour to make those t-shirts. Right? right. Or, and we want all the benefits of being the world's superpower and policing all those shipping and air, uh, highways all over the world and we want to be the world's you the you know reserve currency but we don't want to sp spend any money or blood or doing that and you know and we don't want to be the world's policeman thinking that if we stop being the world's policeman there will be no more policemen and ever and the world will live in peace but you know who wants to be the policeman russia 
China. Right. And if we're living in a world where they are the policemen and they are more powerful than the U.S., and especially if Russia is more powerful than the U.S., believe me, it's not going to be better for you, including in the U.S. And yeah, and, you know, and we can hide. Uh, sorry, I just want to finish this. Yeah, out. No, like, no, yeah, yeah, please. America is it's just the height of like spoil being spoiled and privileged and having two friendly neighbors as our north and south border and the and two oceans as our east and west or borders on the east and west um not all countries have that and eventually shit will come to our doorstep as we learned in world war one as we learned in world war two and you can stay out of things and and decide that it's not our fight but these people will make it your fight they are intent on it and it's right. not just about it like it's such a u.s focused view that it's all because of us and that we're aggravating putin or he came to office like obsessed with the u.s obsessed with nato it's not it's about us but it's not about us and right. um the isolationism on the right and left is is very nice and very privileged but eventually he will make it our problem he has declared that he will yes so you might as well get in you know it's like with world war ii like we could have gotten in for example in europe at a much earlier phase and saved everybody a lot including ourselves a lot of bloodshed and uh money well i think it, it i mean it honestly raises a lot of questions and i and i'll i know you got to go i just will say first of all just only because I once I once had the opportunity when I was thinking about snake a snake eating its own tail. It turns out that in Greek mythology that's called an Ouroboros, an Ouroboros, which is like a name. That's like, well, I like I it's it's now because I had to look it up. I've now remembered it forever. So whenever anybody says, I'm always like, hey, you know what that's called? Um, and then the second thing is just to 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 put the cap on this, right? I think one of the things that I and I know you've talked about this a bunch this week. People say, you know, is Putin is irrational or is he rational? You know, that that debate, which always strikes me as a kind of a it, weirdly a kind of a false binary, because, you know, there's a kind of rationality or at least a kind of logic that even really delusional people have. Right. Absolutely. It's not it's not like when you say someone's irrational, people think, well, they're they're, they're as the as the British uh, uh, defense minister said, apparently, you know, he's gone full tanto, um, which is not only weird, but kind of racist, but it's like that notion that he's, that he's the bonkers, right? It's not, he's not unhinged. It, there's a rationality and a clarity, Absolutely. but it's just not the logic that we have. And the reason I raise it is just because it does seem to me that like, you know, you're being very selective when you're, when you're yeah, a despot and, and really any leader of any country about what information you look at. And you are go, you're always picking and choosing. You're always saying, well, the condemnation, that's just over there. Where can I find some approval? And mm -hmm. if you can find some approval out there, especially if you can find it in the United States on the part of like Donald Trump and Mike Pompeo and other people, you can mm -hmm. very easily convince yourself exactly. that the world's not against you and that can lead you to do some very fucked up shit. Look, Again, I've spent way too much time watching shitty Russia. Now that Mike is gone, I can just let him rip. Uh, uh, <laughs> Russian you... propaganda, yeah. which is just their like evening newscast, right? Because all of television is controlled by the Kremlin. And it's, uh, guess who they're quoting all the time? Donald Trump and Tucker Carlson and Tulsi Gabbard. They they're... They play you know, Tucker. Like, they play Tucker on RT at this point. They just take chunks of Tucker and put it on, yeah. literally, and put it on RT. You see it yeah. there. I'm not kidding. I don't. I don't know how much people watch RT inside Russia, but on their, you know, domestic news, there's a lot of yeah. Tucker. Yeah, I I agree with you. I think when people say irrational, they mean this person doesn't think the way I do. Right. And yes. I think for the first time we have an administration that gets Putin and gets sees him clearly, in part because so many people handling foreign policy in the Biden administration, including Biden himself, dealt with Putin in uh, during the Obama administration. Right. And they understand that. But before, there was always this, um, and I remember so many arguments I had with people in the US about this, like, he would never do the X because it's irrational. It doesn't make sense. Like it doesn't make sense to you, but it makes, here's how it makes perfect sense to him. It's like we're operating in, you know, base 10 and he's operating in base 12 and you have to do some conversion for those things to line up. Sorry, a little math throwback.
Yeah, really. Seriously, I that, that first of all the math throwback, and then also I lo- I have to say it's the most charming thing I've ever heard, which is that you restrain yourself from using profanity because like out of some respect for Michael McFall. I think that's an ina- <laughs> you're like well now that Michael McFall is gone, I can just drop f bombs left, right, and center. But before I felt like I should probably like watch my mouth. Um, listen, um, thank you for taking the time. Like I if I could I really could talk to you and to him really for like for hours and hours. And hours but you guys are like the busiest people on planet Earth right now because yeah. you, because you're brilliant and you know what you're talking about. And this is a really like the most important story in the world right now. And um, so you're in demand. But thank you for taking a little time to chat with me and him and be with us. Thank you so much, John. Thanks for having me. This has been really fun, Uh, you know, for all things considered. (laughs) Given that we're talking about a war, right? Yeah.